Every conference or symposium needs to have at least one motivational speaker. And this morning, we are bringing you ours. In the geospatial community, Almost everyone would agree that Brian Monheiser is filled with motivation. He bleeds geo, but most importantly, he bleeds St. Louis geo. In fact, the growing relationship between UMSL and AGS is really due to Brian, who had the foresight to introduce our two organizations to each other. Today, Brian is joined by Michael Faust, who is a teacher from St. John Vianney High School and is responsible for geography at that institution and has developed his own vast set of geo tools for the classroom and most recently convinced his school to add AP Human Geography to their selection of courses. So Brian and Michael, we're ready for a very entertaining session. I feel important for a brief moment. Um, Good morning, uh, Dr. Tanoshki. Thanks for the, uh, the warm introduction. For those of you that don't know me, I am Brian Monheiser. Um, have been in the geospatial community for about 25 years now. I did mine in kind of a non-traditional route. And um, for those of you in the, in, in the room that have students that maybe aren't going to go to college, don't want to go to college, aren't sure if they should go to college, I took kind of an interesting route. I went to college. Uh, oh. oh. I was in a college town for four years. Um, I worked a little, I uh, drank a lot, and had a good time, but that led to going to the Marine Corps and getting involved in geospatial intelligence. Had I not done that, I wouldn't have this career. Um, I wouldn't have had the opportunities I've had. I wouldn't have learned what I did. And so it's interesting, right, when you have young people that maybe aren't ready for college or don't want to go to college, there's some really, really amazing opportunities via the military that can get you into career fields that pay you six-figure paychecks um, without a degree. Um, good friend of mine in here, Ian Warner from, from Tremble, folks that do geodetic survey, that was the very first thing that we learned in the schoolhouse, right? We did geodetic survey so that we could understand this, this planet we were walking around on. That's a career that can pay you six figures, hoofing a bunch of a gear around the field just to, to do geodetic survey. So there's so many opportunities, uh, and I'm wildly thankful that my Marine Corps time provided me with those. So that Marine Corps time led me to um, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, where I got my first big boy job as an instructor in the schoolhouse there, the same schoolhouse that um, all the Marines and, and, and soldiers go through that are doing geospatial intelligence. Um, I finally did get my degree from the University of Maryland. Uh, it only took me 11 years, um, which is pretty impressive because it's still just a bachelor's. Um, <laughs> And then I've worked at companies like Esri. I've worked at companies like BAE Systems. I've worked in a number of companies that are in the industry before starting my own consulting company uh, with a business partner of mine about three years ago. Uh, I'm super excited to be here, and I'm super excited to introduce you guys uh, to Mr. Faust, Mr. Michael Faust. Uh, I'll let him tell you a little bit about himself, and then we'll tell you how we became the dynamic duo that we are for this moment this morning. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what it means to get these, these opportunities inside of the high school, uh, and then teach people how to get to the next level, whether that's through college and in the industry, or even whether that's through the military. So, Michael? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'm Michael Faust, uh, and I just finished my fifth year at St. John Vianney High School. Um, I kind of fell into the geospatial world by accident, if you will. Um, I've always loved geography, in fact, when I went to college, I was at Butler University in Indianapolis. Um, I really wanted to be a geography teacher. And they had one geographer on staff, and they did not offer even a minor in geography. So I said, what's the closest thing? History. So I became a history teacher. Um, I took every geography class that I could, um, but I came out with a BS in education and a focus in history. Um, and then I kind of got teaching, and what many of you discovered um, probably recently or already know, I discovered very quickly is my kids didn't know where anything was. Um, when I was sitting in my, you know, whatever our ancient world history class at the time, um, and I said the word Rome, half of my kids didn't know that it was in Italy. Half my kids didn't know where Italy was. Um, and so very quickly I was like, oh, that geography thing that I like, this is really important to kind of to, to bring about. Um, 
which led me, in the middle of COVID, I'm looking for an at-home project, and I figured uh, I might as well start my master's degree. And so I was looking for a master's degree that was online uh, at the time, because we're really early on in, in virtual learning, and Marshall University out of Huntington, West Virginia had an online uh, degree program. So I took it, and I just finished that up on April 29th, uh, which was the day my first child was born. So kind of crazy uh, last few few weeks for me. But um, I became super passionate about this, knowing um, that we have such a dynamic industry here in St. Louis as, you know, not to to harp on what everyone else has said, but we have such a dynamic industry here. Um, and knowing so many of my students when they began to get exposed to this, um, were interested in learning more, that their curiosity naturally drove better outcomes, um, that when they got engaged in the coursework and I could incorporate some of the stuff that um, real people are doing here in St. Louis into what we were doing, um, that, I don't know, I found better outcomes with, with students and more interest and, and made my job not only easier but more enjoyable too. Awesome. So uh, as Dr. Konarski said, uh, I love geospatial. If you were here yesterday, I am covered in map tattoos. That's how much I like it. Uh, to my mother's dislike, uh, who said she made some really nice skin for me and took really good care of it, and I've ruined it. Um, I care about this industry so much. I care about it um, both in, in industry, in academia, in government, which is where I've spent most of my time. So I'm always looking for somebody that cares about it as much as I do. Um, I've made it a point in my own home. Uh, we don't do gifts at my house. We do experiences. So my goal is to travel as much with my 16-year-old son as humanly possible so that he has those experiences, can see the world, and can be exposed. So anytime I find somebody that's interested in this, uh, I get excited. So, <laughs> so, so how did we get how did we get to this point? My son comes home from day one of high school, freshman year. I'm like, all right, man, tell me all about it, right? What did you do? How'd you do? What's good? What's bad? And you usually get the whole, it's fine, right? And you just kind of go along. So he's rattling through all of his classes. And he goes, yeah, yeah, in my geography class. And I go, pause. I go, you mean social studies, history? He goes, no, 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 straight up geography class. Not sure how I missed that when we were picking classes. That might have been a, a parent, a parent failure on my part. But he all of a sudden he goes, all right, so I have geography class. And I go, cool, tell me more about it. And so he tells me he's got this really young teacher. He keeps calling him Michael J. Faust, and he's using the Michael J. Fox reference. I've heard Michael J. Faust. I've heard uh, the Fausty. I've heard all kinds of special names. So I instantly knew that my kid thought the teacher was amazing. That's win number one. And then the fact that he was focusing purely on geography was definitely win number two for me, and I had to reach out to Mr. Faust right away, and I wanted to ask him, you know, why are you doing this? Why, I, I mean, I'm excited. How can I help you? Are there people that I know that I can connect you to? Do you want access to technology? Do you want me to come in your room and be a guest speaker? Um, you know, got to the point of even having, as you heard, well, some of you that were here yesterday would have heard the geographer of the United States from the State Department, who is, that's a pretty big title. He even lectured uh, to Mr. Faust geography class it was online during COVID, but it was still awfully cool. So I was super excited that there was this person that was going to kind of put this time in. And then the more that he and I talked, he was like, yep, I'm going to build an intro to GIS and mapping course. Uh, I'm going to do AP Human Geography. And, and I was sold, right? This is now my, my geo brother, right? I want to see him do well. I want to see him win. I want to see him create programs. But I think even more so, I want to see whatever it is that he does. I'm sure there's a lot of you in the audience that are doing what you do. How do we replicate that to other places? How do we replicate that in other schools? How do we take some of the things that he's figured out and learned and found or stolen, right? I, I always think to myself, there, there's 3,100 jobs at NGA. I'm pretty sure most of those people have kids, right? So how many of those people are parents to your students, right? That could be doing the same things. What do I know? Who do I know? How do I know them? How can I connect them? So I'm always interested to kind of figure out how to, how to group those connections and make something special happen. Um, and so it's kind, of a, it's kind of our story and then how he got into it. And uh, hopefully we can figure out how to help you guys going forward. So you know, the first question that, that I have for Michael um, you know, is we know that geospatial STEM is exploding. Um, you heard Zakita talk about it this morning. You've heard Bob Sharp talk about it. There's a number of different programs, whether you know it or not. If you look on the internet, there's actually more than you could possibly imagine. Um, are they all coordinated and working together and providing the same things? No, not exactly, but there's a bunch of those out there. 
So I think the big thing that, that kind of comes up is, you know, for, for Michael is, you know, what tools are out there and how do we build those connections? And I know yeah. you've started some of that, so I'd be happy if you'd chat with everybody here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also important to just start with STEM period. Uh, and I will recognize, I'm not even a STEM teacher. Um, but the push is there and it became, I mean, as you all know, a buzzword. Um, and even parents will ask, you know, what STEM classes can my, can my student take? Um, so it really, for me, kind of started there of what are ways in which we can be cross-curricular um, in our teaching and how can we find things um, that really harp on science, technology, engineering, math in a social studies course um, or an English course. Um, it doesn't just have to be in the sciences. It doesn't have to be um, secluded to one end of the building. It can really be a part of everybody's um, instruction. I was just thinking this morning um, of ways to kind of apply this elsewhere. Um, and I am sure there is an ArcGIS story map on Shakespeare and you know, the worlds that he's created. You can't tell me uh, that you can read a play without imagining a setting that it's in, right? And if you can imagine a setting, particularly you know, if you're basing it in real life, um, you can explore that place, right? And so that's where, for me, um, as it was exploding, as those resources um, started to flow um, just from different places, when I would ask Brian for stuff, um, trying to figure out, okay, what are really low stakes ways that we can incorporate the stuff in? Um, I think somebody mentioned earlier that we are, our plates are full as teachers. Um, it's really important to find ways to do this quickly for us. Um, time is everyone's most precious resource. Um, it absolutely is. And so I, I was, um, for, for a class, I was reading an article by Mary Curtis, who's out of um, UT Austin, and, excuse me, UT Arlington. Um, and she actually sought to, to research this problem of why are these technologies not necessarily used as much uh, as they could be. And time was the number one thing that she found, um, or the perception that it would take too much time for us. Also a fear of failure. Um, as an educator, I want to put on that you know, perfect performance for my students and I want to make sure I have all the, the questions answered possible. So genuinely, a fear of failure will prevent me from making shifts in my instruction uh, that could possibly benefit their outcomes. Um, so to kind of get back to the original question of using you know, STEM, geospatial STEM, how do you incorporate that into the classroom? Um, again, I'll go back to it's finding the low stakes ways. Um, maybe instead of teaching about Verona in a Shakespeare or literature class, showing Verona. Um, geospatial technology doesn't just have to be OpenStreetMap, doesn't have to be Esri products. It can also be as simple as going to Street View and Google Maps, uh, just taking the five minutes to explore. Geospatial technologies, you've gotten a good microcosm of what they are today, but they're, they're endless. Um, and, and we use them every day without thinking, and our students use them every day without thinking. Yeah, it's interesting, right? How many of your students are using Snapchat or TikTok or, all, I mean, all these things have maps to them, right? I always find it interesting the first time I looked over my son's shoulder and watched him like changing his little Snapchat character and putting a sombrero on him because we're going to Mexico. Now the dude's in a plane and I'm looking at the map and there's all of his buddies, right, all of his friends. I was like, you realize you're using geospatial technology? He's like, huh? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, and the, in the background there, something special is happening. Um, you know, for, the, for getting access to those geospatial tools, what have you found? You know, I talked about the fact that there's 3,100 NGA employees. I'm pretty sure a lot of them have kids. Tara Mott, who's sitting over there in the corner, and Esri, who, who uh, was our sponsor for today's event. There's 3,500 Esri employees scattered all over the country that are willing to share their knowledge or insights or give you access to something. So... How did you find the things that you found so far, and where were those resources at? I'd love to share them with, with the audience. Um, Google is a really good <laughs> resource. Uh, that's, where, that's where it started, um, genuinely. And then I stumbled upon the word geo-inquiry, and I was like, that's a fun word. Uh, my students will not be able to say the first time. And um, so I actually just tapped into Esri's resources at first. I was teaching, uh, at the time, ancient world history and a geography section in that um, and so when we started talking about world religions, there was a geo-inquiry about um, religious sites in Jerusalem, for example. And so that was kind of my window in, um, was finding that. But um, more recently, 
raise your hand if you're a part of a Facebook group for like professional development purposes. That is, I was shocked at how I underutilized that. Um, Facebook, I don't know, about three years ago became just almost a, a useless tool for me. So many of my friends became um, enamored with Instagram and moved on to other stuff. And then um, I heard one person tell me at a conference, hey, request to join the AP Human Geography group. And so I did, and there is a treasure trove of resources there. People have built full-on curriculums. People have built um, movie guides for different things. Um, even stuff not related to geography, I've, or to AP Human Geography, I've found to incorporate into my history courses. Um, for example, like US history, teaching westward expansion, I found um, stuff with maps uh, regarding you know, the geographic aspect of westward expansion. So um, I, there are a ton of different social media groups, primarily Facebook, that are loaded with professionals that are just, it's, it's a free teachers pay teachers, right? That are just willing to share all these resources. So that was a big one for me. Um, and then, yeah, Esri as well with, with the geo inquiries were the two big ones. Speaking of AP Human Geography, how many of you educators are AP Human Geography teachers in here? Raise your hand. So you're about four or five. So two pieces I'm gonna tell you. First, you'd better find Nicole when this is over because she wants your attention for a specific reason. I promise she's not gonna to try to sell you something. The second thing is I didn't even realize and I've been a AGS fellow for a long time. I've been an AGS supporter and sponsor and cheerleader for a very long time. When I started talking to John about Mike, Michael, I said, what other resources do you have? He's like, you know, that's one of our, you know, that's one of our core, core goals is to focus on AP human geography. And so I started, I was able to start funneling Michael all of these different resources that were, were coming from AGS. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the, the network I think is the biggest thing. And if you guys have thoughts or ideas or opinions, I'll give every one of you my, my card or my email address. If you want to be connected to somebody somewhere, somehow, for some reason so that you can grow um, you know, your, your abilities in the classroom, let us know. Um, you know. What are some of the, you know, the things that we should be thinking about about post-secondary education, right? I think one of the things that I'm very passionate about, and I, I say this often when I'm in meetings in my normal work life, almost every time I look at a Zoom, it's nothing but white males. And it drives me insane. And the reason that that is, in my opinion, is because we aren't teaching geography as much in schools. We aren't teaching the geosciences. We aren't talking about the jobs and the careers that are out there. I think one of the things that we should be doing, and I'm sure you guys have these parents in your, in your schools too, the Lockheeds, the Boeings, the Raytheons, the, the Esri's, the Hexagons. There are so many companies out there that are doing geospatial things. Ask those teachers, or ask those, those people to come into your schools and talk about what they do. Maps, computers, sensors, satellites, all of those things are career fields that I don't think you know about, unless your mom or your dad did it, or your Uncle Bob did it. And I think there's an opportunity for us to start expanding uh, the minds of these kids and how they get to school and where they can go to school and what those opportunities are, even if those opportunities are the military. So I'd ask you, Michael, what are some of your ideas uh, you know, around post-secondary opportunities. Yeah. You know, what do we, what, what do we need to know and communicate to benefit our students? Yeah, so my students, um, even starting as early as ninth grade, are already thinking about that next step. Um, and I have many students who are incredibly worried about that. Um, and one of the things that I try to always discuss is, hey, when you go to college or the equivalent thereof, right, um, n recognizing that there are so many career opportunities and career paths that don't necessarily mean a four-year university. Particularly with geospatial, um, there are certificate programs all over the place that might just take a couple years and you can become a geospatial analyst right away. Um, so I think one thing is we've seen just this a massive amount of pressure on students of, hey, college, 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 college. That's great. That's one avenue um, there. And there are also um, you know, colleges and universities who are trying to do that outreach um, to make it more accessible for people. I know UMSA with the Bridge Program, I just learned about this past week and was floored that um, Chancellor, 37 years and 100% matriculation rate with students. Since 2003. Okay, since, since 2003. But that being a program for students um, 
to just show that, hey, you don't have to have it all together right now at 14 years old. Like, we're asking a lot of our students at 14, 15 years old um, to be thinking about these things where, you know, they feel like, I can't even think about, you know, whatever, where lunch is coming from tomorrow. Um, so being able to, to expand on the post-secondary opportunities um, beyond university level or the, the avenues and bridges to get them there if they want to be there. What, what are, what are um, thoughts or ideas or, or methods you're gonna employ? I never, and I'm putting you on the spot yeah. here because I realize this is year one. I'm mm -hmm. asking you to, to move mountains year one. What do you do in year one that, to, that you can measure the success of what you've done, the measure of have I positioned these young people in the right position to go get those jobs? Yeah. What, do you, what do you put to kind of go measure that in the next year to two years? Um, I think transferable skills, um, and I'll be more specific in a, in a second, but um, one of the things I just looked at, our school's campus is not on OpenStreetMap. Um, it, it's not. In fact, the neighborhoods around our school's campus is not on OpenStreetMap. So um, when we talk about mapping in that first unit in AP Human Geography, um, we can actually go do a little bit of it. And if all my students walk out of there, yeah, I know how to map some of this stuff. Those are all valuable skills that transfer way beyond just OpenStreetMap or just mapping softwares. Um, that's where STEM is so you know critical, where all of these things connect. When you start to dive deeper into GIS, you realize, you know, the importance of Python and computer programming. And the amount of my students who, I, I am not a coder. I've never written code. Uh, I don't know Python, although I'd love to. Um, there are students who are just taking basic computer science courses as a part of their required curriculum who uh, would dive into this really, really quickly. So, yeah, I would say my first year is um, the goal for a lot of these courses is just going to be how can we develop those skills that will transfer to other courses and then beyond. Awesome. Uh, show of hands, who's ever heard of launch code? That's a fair number, right? There's a lot of really good programs out there too. I'll tell you one of the skills that's missing, and um, Dr. Nikki Markiel is not here today, uh, but she's one of the senior executives at NGA that, that focuses on genetic sciences, right? The hardcore math, right? How, does, how do our datums ellipsoids work? How do projections work? How does the, the, the gravitational force of, of the Earth uh, factor into weapon systems, right? Like the things that they do there and have to understand, that's a, that's a dying breed, right? We need to start having more of those. We also need to start focusing on, to Michael's point, people that can develop. There's a lot of really cool tools out there, but how do you start customizing tools? How do you build new tools? How do you create ways to automate processes to make your work easier. So those are some other things. I think we kind of lose sight of all the different places that you can go have a, a job, right, doing geospatial something. Yesterday, it was almost all agriculture in here, right? The week prior, we had the GEOINT Symposium held by USGIF, it was almost all national defense. You could get an entire group in here doing just spatial finance, right? So FinTech and geospatial. So there's all these different career fields that you can get involved in. Raise of hands, who feels like their resource, I should, I should caveat this, because teachers should get paid 10X what they get paid, that's first of all. And you don't have all the resources, but who feels like they're resource constrained in terms of access to other people who might, have, who, who might be able to give them access to the things they want? Everybody has every connection they could ever want? I'd argue no, but that's, I, that's, that's good. Um, you know, I think the, the one last thing I have for you, Michael, um, what are you going to do or what do you hope to do with your program um, that can benefit not only the school you work at, but outside the school and, and the community of St. Louis? Yeah. Um, Long-term projects kind of, I'm trying to begin the semester with asking students what problems are there in your community. Um, to borrow a quote from, from Admiral Sharp, everything happens in space and time. Um, so what issues are happening in your community and how can we study those or incorporate those issues uh, into what we're studying? So in the AP Human Geo side, when it comes to culture or uh, food and agriculture, what are ways in which um, this problem has, like how can we look at those um, through those lenses um, to, to look at these problems? So I think just getting student buy-in, figuring out what's important to them, um, asking them to develop their own solutions over the course of the semester. 
um, I think is, is something that, as I mentioned earlier, it stimulates their cu curiosity, um, gets buy-in, and um, makes our jobs a, a heck of a lot more interesting and fun. Do you have any suggestions on maybe ways to incentivize? I mean, getting your grade is certainly, yeah. certainly one way to incentivize kids, but can you think of other ways to incentivize kids? I know we talked uh, in the back of the room earlier uh, at, at Viani, and I know at a lot of the, at the parochial schools, they're, they do service projects, right? So in your junior year, you're supposed to take, you know, what, two or three weeks and set aside, and you're supposed to do a service project. And I've asked on multiple occasions, you know, what did you do? And I'm going to sound like a bad person when I say this. So one other thing to know about me, too, I'm not really good at mixing words. I just, they come out the way they come out. I sat at an event with Julie Murphy, and, I, and it was for Unleashing Potential. And when I realized that there were young people that didn't have art supplies, I'm madly texting my son, telling him what an awful person he is because he's on his 11th iPhone, and he can't keep up with his jacket. And there's some kid that doesn't have, have art supplies. Um, you know, I think the one thing that I keep thinking about is how do we do, how do we turn those service projects, how could we turn those into a geospatial service project, right? How could we do something that either benefits another group of people that don't have access to the same things you have access to, or how do we benefit a community by doing a project? And we heard some of that earlier today. How do we make that change? Like, how can yeah. we turn those into a service project? I, I think... I always ask myself in a lot of my lesson planning of like, okay, what are, what are we gonna do with this? Um, why, obviously the objectives and, and we get uh, told from the state what we need to be teaching and all that stuff, but um, thinking about how can we take this beyond the classroom? Um, I, to put, get on my inspirational speaker, motivational speaker podium for a second. Get it. Um, think about how many times a group of students have, have influenced change just in this country, in this city. Uh, people listen to students. Students are powerful. Uh, uh, young people are powerful. And so I think about, right, if you identify that project in your, in your community, um, and I know this takes a lot of love and support, time on our end, which we don't always have time for, um, but being able to say, okay, this is a problem, and when we're done, we're gonna take this to the county chamber. We're going to take this to the mayor's office. Uh, we're going to take this and present this and do something with this. And maybe they don't do anything about it, but they're more aware now. And we've made a mission uh, out of what we've done in our classroom, and it's gone way beyond that. Um, and I think that also helps to develop those students to realize that they have a voice. Um, I was, one of my former teachers is actually in the room, and he can attest that I was this quiet kid who sat in back uh, and just minded my own business and did not want to cause any disruptions in class ever. Um, I think about how valuable it would have been to hear that my voice matters, that how empowering it would have been um, to have that told to me. Um, so I don't know, getting back off the podium now, it might be, um, it, it truly is difficult to go that step beyond, but thinking about how can we take this outside of the room and how can we let students feel empowered to actually try to go make a change in their community? Yeah, the reason I brought that up, and I, I jokingly said earlier, but I, I didn't mean it as a joke. My son has two friends that are juniors, and they're a junior service project, and they're both phenomenal musicians. They were going to go around to a bunch of old folks' homes and play music for them. I said, hey, not for nothing. And this is where I come off as being the bad guy. They've had a really good life, right? Playing a little bit of music, that seems like a cop-out in a really easy way to get your service hours. What are you doing that's gonna have a long-lasting impact, right? Who are you gonna go work with that has a long-lasting impact? So you know, I say that because I would challenge some of you. Let's ask these kids that are doing service projects too. What's that service project gonna be? What community is it gonna be towards? And how's it actually gonna make a difference for the next 60 years and not for just the next six, right? And so I wanna see some of that happen as well. Um, I've appreciated our time together. I appreciate the fact that um, you've made a commitment uh, to our students to teach geography. I'm committed to helping you. I'm committed to helping all of you. You know, I'd also say this too, and I'm, I'm ashamed of myself for having not learned more. I didn't meet Clinton until just this week, and he got up and gave his presentation yesterday on the, on the programs that he's working on. I would encourage you to get with him too and find out ways you can partner with him. He's right here in front, raise your hand. Not only, not only a phenomenal human, but he's doing a lot of great work. And we're going to have to do, if we want to start seeing, like I said earlier, Zoom meetings that aren't a bunch of old white guys talking to one another, 
We're gonna have to partner with people like, like him, and we're gonna have to go do some good work. So I encourage you to do that as well. If that's, uh, with, with that, if there's any questions, we'll open it up for questions. If not, we're going to take our stepbrothers duo uh, off the stage. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you for your time. <laughs>